I was born in Wandsworth in the middle of the war um, and um, evacuated to Shirley. And uh, when my dad got out of the RAF, uh, he bought a house in Harpenden. Which is in the, the home counties, about what, about 30 miles north of London? Yeah, it's, uh, yes, it's near St. Albans. I mean, it's a little, little further north of the, the, than St. Albans. And, uh, yeah, 30, 30 to 35 miles north of London. And what did your parents do for work? My dad was a stained glass artist. Uh, he, he painted stained glass for churches mostly, and um, his sort of crowning achievement was that he and his partner, who had also been in the RAF, painted the RAF memorial window in uh, the Henry VII Chapel in Westminster Abbey. Wow. There's a huge RAF memorial window there, which my dad and, uh, and Jeff Harper, who was his partner, painted, although they didn't design it. And the guy who designed it was a guy called Hugh Easton, later Sir Hugh Easton, who basically got most of the credit for the window. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere in this window, my dad, who had a good sense of humor, uh, and, his, and, his, and his pal wrote in tiny letters, Hugh Easton got all the credit for this window, but we painted it. Robert, Robert Hendra and Jeffrey Harper. <laughs> so he had a, a sense of humor quite early on, though. So do you reckon that's where you got it from? Well, my mum was pretty funny, too, in her younger days. So, yeah, we, we were a sort of, kind of uh, talkative family, you know. And I'm not sure that I, I got it from either of them, really. It just seemed like a general thing that, uh, that happened. And were you a, a fan of, of the comedy of the day? Very much so. I mean, I grew up on the goons. We present those friends of royalty, the goons. <laughs> Is this the Green Sailor Inn? Yes, Mike. Then part seven, in which two travellers arrive at the inn. Oh. <laughs> well, I'd better go and get the beds ready, mate. Oh, yes, yes, mate. Yes, mate. And a bowl of steaming venison and a side of mead for our horse's friends. Who's your horse's friends? We are. Oh. <laughs> and landlord, we want a room with the walls facing inwards, a table laid with your best silver and napier. Eh? Yes, and a window overlooking our horse. And a set of knotted sheets hanging therefrom. Yeah. Wait a minute, mate. What, mate? Sheets hanging out the window? Yes, mate. Oh, I know what you're going to do, matey. The moment my back's turned, <laughs> that horse will be up them sheets for a free night's <laughs> sleep. <laughs> and uh, still adore the goons. I luckily can watch them on YouTube. And then, you know, sort of all the other, all the other guys uh, who... Um, Kenneth Horn and all those people, sort of 50s radio comedy uh, that, that I completely adored. Tony Hancock, obviously. I'll hold out your hand, please. Now, this won't hurt. You'll just feel a slight prick on the end of your finger. Go! Oh! <laughs> By the centre, dear, oh dear. <laughs> well, that's that. I'll have my cup of tea and my biscuit now. Well, oh, nothing to it, is there, really? I can't understand why everybody doesn't do it. Well, I'll bid you good day. Thanks very much. Whenever you want any more, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Now, where are you going? Have me tea and biscuits. <laughs> I thought you came here to give some of your blood. You've just had it. <laughs> this is just a smear. It may be just a smear to you, mate, but it's life and death to some poor wretch. <laughs> no, no, no. I've just taken a small sample to test. A sample? How much do you want, then? Well, a, a pint, of course. A pint? <laughs> You can't rave in there. <laughs> oh, well, of course. I mean, you must be joking. A pint is a perfectly normal quantity to take. You don't seriously expect me to believe that. I mean, I came in here in all good faith to help me country. I don't mind giving a reasonable amount, but a pint? Well, that's very nearly an armful. Um, so, you know, I, I grew up on those, but the big, the big, uh, my big sort of moment of conversion was seeing Beyond the Fringe uh, in 1960. Yeah. Um, and that sort of changed my whole idea about what humor could do and, uh, and sound like. And the first thing that will strike you about the Americans is they're not English. Well, of course they're not English, they're American. And what I mean is they're not English, they're not of English stock. I mean, you only have to look at the names, Lefkowitz, Ribblewitz, Vaseline, those aren't English names. <laughs> They used to be. No, they never were. No, I mean, they used to be very good English stock, though, no Anglo-Saxon stock. Puritan. Exactly, as it was the Statue of Liberty that started the rot. How was that? Well, you see, they put up the statue, and I mean, it's a lovely statue. Well, it's, it's a lovely statue. It's a beautiful statue. statue. <laughs> then, 
Some idealistic Johnny went and inscribed on the bottom all this business about, um, give me your poor, your huddled masses. Mm. Well, of course, people did. <laughs> the huddled masses leapt at the opportunity. They came over in droves. Bred like rabbits, died like flies. And spread like wildfire. The whole place was swamped. <laughs> Isn't there a very serious colour problem over there? Yes, there is, but you won't have any difficulty. <laughs> I think there is a very real danger of seeing the colour problem simply in terms of black and white. It is a lot more complicated than that. Yeah. But I gather the Negroes are sweeping the country. Yes, <laughs> so they are. It's about the only job they can get. <laughs> is that when you worked out that you could be funny? Um, well, I was actually the time. I was, I was hoping to become a monk. Um, uh, which, which is a journey I, uh, I, I had undertaken a few years before in rather odd circumstances. Um, and in my first year at Cambridge, I was actually uh, being a very good little monk and, and sort of studying hard, and I got a, 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 almost a double first in English. But, uh, but when I went to see this show, um, which I think was in the, would have been in the fall of uh, 1960, I went into that theatre a monk and came out a satirist. Is that when you got involved with Footlights in Cambridge? Yes, exactly. And we could not very long after. And in fact, uh, there was a, a sort of um, fair that they used to have at Cambridge to to attract, you know, recruits to various various societies. And uh, Footlights had a a table there, and I signed up for that uh, immediately, and um, and luckily was accepted. For those who don't know the influence of Beyond the Fringe, I mean, it was Peter Cook and Dudley Moore and Alan Bennett and, and Jonathan Miller. I think this was the first time that the establishment was used as a as a source f for humour. It was probably the the first real British satire. What was it exactly that that turned the light on in you then? Well, I think it was precisely that. I mean, I, I would go a little further and say that it was probably the first time, for at least for, for a, a century or more, that, that that all the sort of sacred goods of England had been assembled on one stage and just taken to pieces. And I mean, it was it it, it, it ran the gamut. It ran the gamut from, you know, the, the royal family to uh, the BBC to World War Two. Um, and the Church of England, and uh, and and, ev and everything in between, and and it, as I said, it just uh, it just took them apart, and I never knew that 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 you could do this, that you were sort of allowed to do this, if you like, uh, and, or that you could uh, or that you you could rock an audience with with this kind of laughter, explosive laughter at this um, at, at this kind of impudence. So I decided that's what definitely what I wanted to do, and um, did my best to do it for the rest of my life. Was there a feeling of of like release from an oppression in a way? It was it was it that well, kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in partly partly it was. It was more that you, I, I, for me anyway, it, it was more that you could see that that laughter like this might actually ch have a, have a potential to change things, or at least to change people's minds, and that really intrigued me. And I think beyond the fringe, probably, and its and its effect and its immediate children, like that was the week that was, um, uh, all did have an effect on the culture. And, and I think that's, uh, that's just splendid. I think, I think the, more, more, the more satire, the better, frankly. I think it's a, it's a sign of a very healthy democracy. And, um, and so, anyway, that, that was, as, a point, as, as I said earlier, that was my point of conversion. And when I was at Cambridge, uh, I was lucky enough to be there with John Cleese, Graham Chapman, and Tim Brooke Taylor, and, uh, and later Bill Oddie. And before us, David Frost had been the president of Footlights the year before us, and he had gone down to London to, you know, begin uh, to do some comedy, first of all, at the Blue Angel, and then to work on getting, that was the week that was made. So it was a pretty heady time. I didn't realize it at the time, but now that I look back on it, yeah, I was extremely lucky. And, and David Frost was incredibly powerful at that time. W were you able to use any of that? Well, we... To your advantage? Well, I mean, we all tried. Once, once CW3 was up and running, we all tried to write for it, and, and some of us were successful and some of us, some of us, some of us weren't. Um, um, I, I'm pretty certain John, John and Graham wrote some stuff for him because uh, they worked with him later. And uh, I think I got one thing on at one point, but uh, I can't remember what it was. But it, anyway, it's listed in my IMBD as uh, 
one of my credits. Uh, <laughs> so that's uh, that's nice. But um, but in terms of the power of it, uh, it, it was it, the, his power was was uh, was such that when people went down from Cambridge, they had a door to knock on, yeah, which they didn't before. And of course, Beyond the Fringe was still running at that point too. It, it, by that time, it, it had come to Broadway. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it was it was a time when satire was very much in the air, and I think was um, getting people to sort of think in new ways about all these things that they'd had perhaps far too much respect for throughout the fifties. Well, one of the things you must have had respect for was religion, because, like you say, you wanted to be a monk, and and you had this role model in Father Joe, right. and and it's and it's there in the book. How I mean, satire beyond the fringe, Monty Python, and yourself have have really had a go at organized religion. How do you how do you square that circle? Uh, well, it uh, to be to be brutally honest, um, my faith dropped away from me rather quickly once I made this discovery. Um, <laughs> right. And, um, I would say by the time I started working in London with Graham, uh, which was in 1963, we were already doing sort of. Uh, there was one very favourite blackout that we did that uh, I can't remember who came up with it. it. May have been Graham actually, but it was done in the darkness with a spotlight, and there's a priest is just in Latin, is just chanting numbers, you know, like Septua Viginti, you know, sort of Latin numbers, and mm -hmm. just, you have no idea what's going on, and then someone right in front of him jumps up and says, bingo! <laughs> and and uh, brought the house down. I mean, that that, that was like the beginning of my, the beginning of the end for me. Once, once I realized you could get laughs and stuff like that, I, I did a lot of that stuff. And what about now? Do you have a faith now? Um, not really. I'm very proud of my Catholic uh, background. I'm proud, proud of the Catholic traditions in in a very deep sense. I don't know too. I'm not too proud of the church over the last over the last half century. But uh, but I think Catholicism gets a fairly mean crack out of the reputation makers. It re it really had some great moments. In fact, I'm writing or I'm working on it, uh, what might be regarded as a sort of fiction prequel to Father Joe which is set in the 12th century at the incredibly important monastery of Cluny. So um, that's, that'll be my next book, actually. Because your dad was agnostic, wasn't he? Yes, my dad was, was definitely agnostic, but as I pointed out, he probably knew more about Catholicism and spent more time in Catholic churches than his wife or children did uh, because, of, because of his calling. But he was, very, no, he was very staunchly so. He said, I haven't got any answers, I don't think there are any. But he... You know, it was a mixed marriage, so he had to respect my mother's faith, and we were all brought up Catholic. How did your mother take to you satirizing the church? I didn't really let her know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't, I mean, maybe one of the reasons I went to America, you know, to get, so she wouldn't be able to see what I was doing. Yeah. But no, I mean, I, she, she got the message later on, but, but it, it, it wasn't something that I shared with her. But none of us, four children, are Catholic at this point. Um, yeah, I, I still do plenty of good stuff in that line. In 64, you moved to America, uh, as you said. What was right. the main reason for moving? Well, the main reason, re reason for moving actually was just as kind of a lark. Um, in those days, you, you could get a, a first-class stateroom on a, a transatlantic liner if you agreed to do a show for the passengers. Yeah. Uh, on the way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so my partner, who, who was another footlighter, Graham had decided he wanted to become a doctor. So my partner at that point was a guy called Nick Ullett, who was also a footlighter and a musician, which was useful. Had been working at various places in the, uh, in, in the West End, like the Blue Angel, following in, in David Frost's footsteps. And um, a, an American comedian uh, came to headline at the Blue Angel called Jackie Mason. Yeah, uh, to a young ex-rabbi, who we loved. I, I loved his stuff. It was all, probably because a lot of it was about religion and God. And he took a shine to us, as did his manager, a guy called Robert Chartoff. And Robert later became a very famous film producer. Did all the, you know, Rocky one through twenty, whatever it was, and um, a bunch of other movies. Anyway, he said, uh, "Look, if you ever want to come to New York, I'll manage you, and um, just uh, hop on a boat and come on over and see if you like it." So we decided a few weeks later, this was right around the time of the Beatles appearing on Ed Sullivan for the first time, we decided we'd give it a try. And um, 
we got on the boat. Uh, it was called the SS United States, and it was the fastest liner in the group at that point. And um, the crew later said that it was the worst crossing of the Atlantic they'd ever experienced in, like, you know, anyone's experience, 20, 30 years. Yeah. And everybody of the 800-passenger complement was seasick all the way. So we never had to do a show, and um, we ate, like, ate and drank like kings and got across the Atlantic in a first-class stateroom. So when we got there, almost as soon as we got there in New York, Bob Chardoff put us on stage at a place called The Bitter End on Bleecker Street, a legendary place which is still there, at something called a Hootenanny. And a Hootenanny was kind of the sort of folk version of an open mic where comedians were allowed to, you know, come along as well, but mostly it was about folk singers and and, and, and so forth. And for some reason, we brought the house down at this Hootenanny and got about six months of work that very night. And... Um, the very first job we got was across the street at a place called Cafe Gogo, and uh, the job was opening for Lenny Bruce. Wow, which was pretty extraordinary. So here we were on, you know, we'd, we'd been on American soil for about, I don't know, 24, 48 hours, and we had six months' work. We were opening for our idol, Lenny Bruce, uh, in in Greenwich Village, and. Um, and we were driving north up Park Avenue with the roof open, and. Uh, a bottle of champagne. We we couldn't have been happier. Yeah, <laughs> and it went it went downhill from there. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> um, now, Lenny anyway. Bruce, you were there the night he was busted. That must have been a bit scary because you've just arrived there and you want to push the envelope a little bit. He's pushing it a lot. Did it make you rethink the the material and 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 wonder whether you should be playing a little bit safer? Well. It, that's, there's a lot of answers to that, but I mean, the, the initial response was certainly, watch out, Limey, you know, if you're too funny in this country, you'll get arrested. Yeah. And uh, that was sort of the, the, the immediate lesson. But the other lesson was that, um, you know, it, 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 was very, it was very obvious that, that, that Lenny was not being busted for things he was said that they were busting him for. That was obvious even to me, just seeing, having seen him, seen his act, for three or four nights, it was very obvious to me that it wasn't obscenity, which is which is the official reason he was busted. It was because he was doing stuff about religion, right, and specifically about Catholicism, and even more specifically about Jackie Kennedy, and and that's really what uh, what inflamed the the Catholics who went after him in New York, which actually turned out to be his nemesis, and and he that, that actually he was he 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 got out on bail that night, and uh, and he came back and did the show the next day and the next day and it was exactly the same show so they busted him again the next week and and that was really the end of in effect i mean he he, he lived and fought for several years after that but but that actually actually was the end of his career mm. um and uh, the the manhattan da at the time um was a guy called hogan i think his name was who was a, a devout catholic and he was after lenny for the stuff he'd said about the catholic church not then anything to do with sanity Right. So, so anyway, that that was that was one lesson. So much for freedom of speech, eh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it only goes so far. You did a lot of TV back then, though. How did the act translate to the TV of the day? I mean, you were on like Merv Griffin and Ed Sullivan and and even the Perry Como show. Yes. Did you have to change it quite a bit for that? Well, I should say that one of the things we found out very quickly was that our what I would call bargain basement beyond the fringe kind of humour did not go down particularly well in America. It was okay in New York, where people got the, some of the references. But outside of New York, it was just deadly. In fact, the very first booking we got after Lenny Bruce was, of all places, in Dallas. And this was like in April 1964. So that's, you know, five months after the assassination. Yeah. And uh, to make a long story short, we, you know, we got out on the stage and did... You know, uh, we had a piece about the, the, the royal barge with the Queen and Prince Philip on it sinking in the Thames very slowly, which was went down extremely well in London and um, not quite so well, but OK, in New York. And was just a complete, it was just, it was just, it could have been in, in you know, Swiss yeah. for, for, for as far as this, this audience was concerned. And, um, and that, so we had to adapt very quickly to doing much more innocuous material. 
Yeah. I mean, we did some sort of what I would call anti-British material in the sense that we were, we played sort of ridiculously British stereotypes like RAF pilots and, you know, London bobbies and things like that. Um, I mean, if there'd been an association for the protection of British people, they would, they would have been picketing us. Um, <laughs> it, it, was, it, it was just so stereotypical. But it went down pretty well. And, and uh, we actually, yes, we actually became, over time, quite successful. Uh, I mean, to be on those big entertainment shows was a big deal. And you made decent money, too. But it was deadly from the point of view of freedom of speech. I mean, this by now was the mid to late 60s. And, you know, we were in our mid-20s. And uh, all the stuff that we were interested in that was going on outside the doors of the studio. Vietnam, you know, various liberation movements, uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, all the rest of it, just could not be mentioned inside the studio. So basically, the stuff that people were actually talking about over the dinner table, you couldn't touch. Yeah, exactly. I mean, about the, the, the most daring political joke we could do was to make fun of General de Gaulle. And that, was, okay. that, that went down very well. You know, right. How did, how did the joke? Oh, no, General de Gaulle was seriously injured this morning during his during his morning walk. He was hit by a motorboat. And right, right. <laughs> that that that, <laughs> you know, that was okay. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah. Good evening. Here is the news. I'm sorry. I'll read that again. <laughs> Here are the news. <laughs> a man in Nebraska, USA. Today threw a broken beer bottle at Cuba. <laughs> the bottle, which fell some 1,700 miles short of its target, <laughs> was later declared safe by army ballistics experts. <laughs> President de Gaulle, the well-known Frenchman, <laughs> has announced that on September the 3rd of this year, he will be crowned King of Europe. <laughs> President de Gaulle will perform the ceremony himself at the mental home in northern France. <laughs> and now, here is a very important message from the British Ministry of Finance. As you probably know, Britain is 400,000 million pounds sterling in debt to the International Monetary Fund. Unless this sum is raised by public donation within the next three days, the government will be forced to accept the American government's generous offer of $500 million and sell the Queen. <laughs> Countless messages of sympathy and three small checks have been flooding in from all over the world. Canada has launched a Save Our Sovereign Lady Britannic Elizabeth Regina Bonsoir appeal. <laughs> and Australia has offered to hire Her Majesty on a basis of a Lend Liz lease. <laughs> President de Gaulle's personal offer for the Queen has been declined. <laughs> Mr. Harold Wilson, better known as the British Prime Minister, and not even well known as that, <laughs> replied in answer to an appeal, Elizabeth who? Sir <laughs> Alec Douglas Home was unavailable for comment at his London Hume. <laughs> Mr. Alexandrovich Obolensky Romanovich, a British Foreign Office spokesman, <laughs> has appealed to all members of the cabinet at one time or another. <laughs> In the event of Her Majesty being sold to the USA, the Queen announced tonight that she had not yet made up her mind between being a cultural ambassadress to the White House or a bunny. Because <laughs> I've seen I've seen clips of people on like things like the Ed Sullivan Show. There's one I've seen of Morecambe and Wise on the Ed Sullivan Show, and it's it's almost like they're doing a play because the reaction from the audience is like nothing. It's just dead. Oh my God! It's really awful. I mean, it was terrible. It it, 
it was it was like a mausoleum out there and and ed was ed, ed didn't make things any better because he when while you were doing your extremely funny act he would stand over stage right with a spotlight on him and if he didn't laugh the audience wouldn't wouldn't raise a titter you know we we often did our our, our act a complete dead silence in fact we used to call his show night of the living ed and uh <laughs> right. it was um because it was so dreadful but um Anyway, so I, I, and I got uh, I got very tired of this of this kind of life, even though it was paying me very well, because it really was frustrating from a creative point of view not to be able to do anything about any of these issues, you know. And I was sort of I was writing stuff about Goma Pile in Vietnam and sending it to Ramparts Magazine, and then you know going and doing going and doing these stupid jokes on Perry Goma. Right. So is that why you you broke up the comedy team? Yeah. In in '69. Yeah. It, it, I, I said I can't do this anymore, and so I'm going to take my chances. And uh, after a brief stint trying to be a television writer, which wasn't much better than being a television comic, uh, I discovered this this uh, little magazine that was beginning in New York called the National Lampoon, and um, started writing for them. And they didn't care what I wrote about. In fact, one of the first pieces I wrote for the National Lampoon was um, called Eight Days That Shook Wook, Iowa. And it was about the assassination by ice pick of Vice President Agnew. And uh, I was, uh, it was a very funny piece. And it was done, uh, it, it, was, it was all done photographically, and they, they did a very good job of it. And it was really, really shocking. And I, I refused, I actually didn't sign it, because I was worried that the, you know, the immigration people would deport me. But it was, it, it was a place where I could do everything that I hadn't been allowed to do for you know, six or seven years. And was the government of the day Nixon? Was that an influence? Yeah, uh, was that was that was a motivation for writing that kind of stuff? Well, well, I wouldn't say it was motivation. I would say he was a gift. But, uh, <laughs> right. but, but we 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 had plenty of other stuff to write about too. And and as things matured, we sort of got tired of Nixon because he was too easy. We began to find a great deal of satire obviously in the war and all the things that, res that, that Nixon was responsible for, but we also began to find some cause for merriment, let's say, in our own generation. And uh, we became pretty notorious for doing that. Uh, I did the first album that the National Lampoon ever did, which was called Radio Dinner, with uh, this wonderful guy, Michael O'Donoghue, who was an absolute comic genius. And later went on to become the first head writer of Saturday Night Live. And in it, we parodied Bob, Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, and uh, most memorably, John Lennon. Well, the John uh, Lennon one is is, uh, is is pretty brutal, but he was really asking for it after that Rolling Stone interview, wasn't he? Yes, I mean that, that he he every every word in that song, which is mostly obscenity, he had actually said himself, and uh, he was going through something called primal scream therapy at the time. And um, for some reason, he gave the interview to Rolling Stone in sort of a primal scream fit. And, um, and, and we just simply took his words and set them to music. I resent the moment for because tell me what do you know? A lot of faggot middle class kids wearing long hair and trendy clothes. Look, I'm not your fucking parents and I'm sick of upside hippies coming knocking at me door with a fucking peace symbol. Get this up fast. I don't owe your fuckers anything and all I got to say is Cause she 
you didn't treat me like a f***ing genius Look, you bastards, I'm a genius like Shakespeare and Beethoven and Van Gogh Don't you dare criticize my work Don't worry, Kyoko was one of the f***ing best rock and roll records ever made I'm a f***ing artist, I'm sensitive as shit I throw up before I go on stage I can make a guitar speak If I could be a fisherman, I would, but I can't because I'm a f***ing genius I was a walrus, Paul wasn't a walrus I was just saying that to be nice, but I was actually the walrus Even that rubbish he's been singing Stupid middle class pig! I won't let f***ing animals like that near me! Your guys are supreme intellectual! I'll tell you why nobody likes her music! Because she's a woman and she's oriental, that's why! Where are you, mother? We're trying to crucify me! Genius is pain! Genius is pain! Genius is pain! Genius is pain! The dream is over. Did you ever find out what, what Lennon thought of that? Because I would have thought that he would have liked the kind of satire in National Lampoon, but he couldn't have liked that. Well, um, I don't know if this is true, but 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 the the um, I, when I was actually promoting that album, um, I I was thinking, I think it was KRLA. I, I was I was pumping it at one day, and the uh, the engineer there said that that Lennon had been through. Humping his record, I don't know which one it was, but I can't. Don't worry, don't worry, Kyoko Mega, I don't know. But but anyway, so it, but he'd been there quite recently, and they played this cut for him. Yeah. And he just sat there in silence, looking rather white, and then got up and left the studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, that probably tells you all you need to know about his reaction. Yeah, but but here, I'll, but I'll give you, I'll give you a, a very much later epilogue, which was really fascinating. A friend of mine, not long ago, earlier this year, actually. Took the, the song in question, by the way, is called Magical Misery Tour, if people have not heard it. Yeah. And um, earlier this year, a friend of mine, a classical musician, who's also very funny and does a very, very funny classical, classical musician stuff, met me in, in New York and we had a few drinks. And uh, he said, OK, well, let's go and get a nightcap. But uh, I want to ask someone along to come along with you. And he's one of your biggest fans. And I said, well, I don't, don't mind that. And um, by, by all means. So he said, okay, so I'll give him a call now and tell him to join us at the Bowery Bar. And he called him. Then he handed the phone to me and said, this is Sean Lennon. Wow. And I, I said, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, and I, I said, hello, this is Tony Hendra. And Sean answered me, hello, I have listened to your song, Magical Misery Tour, perhaps a thousand times. And I love it. I mean, he, he was just—he he obviously thought it was great, and we had—we had then we had a hilarious evening, uh, you know, reminiscing about all kinds of stuff. So, it all turned out all right in the end. Talking of, of drinking, much later you worked on Spitting Image with Peter Flock, and I want to get to that a little bit later on. Okay. He said that you moved to America from a fear that Britain, being a small island, might one day run out of alcohol. <laughs> uh, how much of a problem was it back then? Um, well, I certainly. Let's put it this way. Everybody at the Lampoon, you know, the documentary just came out about the Lampoon which, about two years ago called Drunk, Stoned, Brilliant, Dead. 
And yeah. um, that is supposed to describe the, the condition of the editors when the documentary actually came out. And I always said, well, I, I, I'm, I'm actually three of those things. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, stoned, drunk, or brilliant. It's, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not dead. So, yeah. um, so we all did. We all did various substances, and 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 I, I don't think I was any more outrageous than anyone else, frankly. But um, but well, Roger, Roger Law also also from Spitting Image, he he says he met you in New York, and I think it was around this time that he's talking about. But he says he was with you, and you were refused to drink in a bar, and you threw a dustbin through a, a plate glass window. That sounds like you might have been a little bit out of control. Um, yeah, I remember that. I think Roger helped me. Uh, this was a time when Roger was actually <laughs> Roger Roger was actually downing between fourteen and eighteen pints a night, so yeah. um, I don't think he uh, would have not helped me. Um, it didn't it didn't break the glass window anyway. Now you mentioned writers going on to do Saturday Night Live, and you are probably the only person in the world that is directly linked to Monty Python through Footlights and to Saturday Night Live. But of course, you also discovered John Belushi. That was that was through Lemmings, the the, the off Broadway uh, review you did, yeah. the, the parody of Woodstock. Yeah, we we yes exactly. We we that was the second National Lampoon album, was, which was what what it was supposed to be originally, um, and we had done these, as I said, we'd done these rock and folk parodies on the first album, and they've been very successful. So we decided we'd do a whole album of rock parodies, and uh, there seemed to be no better target than Woodstock, which had been, you know, about three years earlier, and was certainly the most sacred event that had ever taken place in the rock universe. Uh, so, therefore, we had to satirize it. So, Lemmings was like a full-scale uh, full scale, um, take, take off of uh, not just the people who were at Woodstock, uh, but also quite a few who weren't. Our version of Woodstock was called the Woodchuck Festival of Peace, Love, and Death. And the three main characters in it, well, I mean, lots of the singers were obviously represented by these guys, but I cast um, John Belushi, Chevy Chase, and Christopher Guest in, uh, in, in Lemmings. And between them, they did, you know, uh, half a dozen or more parodies of, of famous people, especially Chris. Christopher did an amazing Bob Dylan both the the sort of old folk Bob Dylan and then the country Bob Dylan, uh, and uh, Jerry did John Denver and a, a bunch of other people, and uh, and Belushi memorably did Joe Cocker, um, which uh, which was absolutely they brought the house down, just an amazing number. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and Lemmings was um, was originally supposed to be a live album. Um, you know, we'd do, we'd sort of, the idea was that we'd run it for, at the Village Gate on Bleecker Street, back on Bleecker Street, um, for a few, uh, for a few weeks and then record the album, but people loved it so much that it turned into an off-Broadway hit. So, um, those were really, were, were for both, all three of those guys, that, that, that was really their first sort of major New York appearance. And where did you find them? Um, well, Christopher had already done uh, a, a Bob Dylan parody uh, on Radio Dinner and some other very funny stuff. He was sort of half a member of the family already. Chase was someone that that he knew, and he had been doing something called, oh, what was it? Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it, there was a, it was a, it, it was satire about television, and I, and he came and auditioned, and, and all the other Lampoon people hated him, but I thought he was great, mainly because he sent up humor itself. I mean, he, he he was sort of funny, but also somehow very reverent about the whole business of being funny, and and it it, uh, it really appealed to me. Uh, and Belushi, um, I was tipped off uh, by another friend, was then appearing at Second City, and so I went to Chicago to see him there. And as soon as I, this guy hit the stage with that beard and those huge beetle eyebrows and sort of rolled around it like a sort of nuclear weapon, um, I knew that I'd found my master of ceremonies for the Woodshock Festival of Peace, Love and Death and hired him on the spot pretty much. We all know what happened to John. How out of control was he? Well, I sort of lost touch with John once he, he was part of Saturday Night Live because I, I really wasn't part of that that group at all. And and so I I didn't really see a lot of him. I mean, occasionally, but it wasn't like I was, you know, as close to him as I was when he was at the Lampoon, because he didn't just do Lemmings; he also did the National Lampoon Radio Hour. 
so I saw a lot of him there. But, you know, in the years after that, I had very little idea. In fact, I mean, I, I knew that he had a problem because everybody did. did. But uh, but I must say, I didn't know it was as, as bad as bad enough to kill him. And it was a very big shock when, when we heard that news. And you continued as editor of the, the Lampoon until 75, when you became co-editor-in-chief until 78. Right. You weren't tempted to go to Saturday Night Live or to television? Uh, and you, you mentioned an early, earlier dabbling as a television writer. Did you have something against TV? Yeah, I, I really hated TV. And I hated it mainly because it was um, because I'd spent six six years in the worst kind of television, which was, you know, 60s, 60s variety shows really were the sort of bottom of the barrel uh, when, mm. it, when it came to television. But, I mean, I also had a generational sort of suspicion of television as being uh, a tool of the government and all that stuff, uh, which uh, plastic man, you know. <laughs> and um, I shared in that, but I, I mean, I, I think I had a slightly more intellectual approach to it. I mean, I did think it was uh, addictive, and I did think it was, it was something that, didn't ever lead anywhere. It lived off the culture rather than leading it. And so I had no interest really at all. In fact, somebody came before Saturday Night Live actually began. Um, somebody came to talk to the Lampoon because they really wanted the Lampoon. That what they wanted to do was the Lampoon on television. Mm -hmm. And everybody knew it and, and, and get away with it somehow. Um, and everybody at the Lampoon knew you couldn't do the Lampoon on television. It just there was just no way that we that they would ever get away with it. Yeah. And so somebody came to pitch it to us, um, and everybody, including actually Michael O'Donoghue, said we, we're not remotely interested in this, and um, you know we'll go our way and you can go yours. So it was not just me. I mean, it was fairly unanimous. And I always thought of Saturday Night Live as being sort of having the appearance of the lampoon, but not the, the real meat of it, not the edge and the, and the anger, too. I, I, I used to call it the sound, but not the fury. Right. And uh, anyway, yeah. So that, then you went on and you did uh, Not the New York Times which, <laughs> yeah, in when print. I, 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 yeah, I eventually left the lampoon, and one of the first things, first things I did, because the lampoon was best known for doing parody, and um, uh, this wonderful opportunity arose because the New York Times, for the first time, I think, in 60 or 70 years, had been struck by the unions. And um, there was no New York Times in, in the, you know, the, the greater metropolitan area of New York. So um, uh, another lampooner called Chris Surf and uh, the wonderful George Plimpton, who was a great friend of his and also uh, uh, originally president of Harvard Lampoon, um, and I and a woman who had the, actually had the idea of doing the New York Times before the strike was over decided, yeah, that we would do a parody of the New York Times and get it out on the newsstands and feed everybody's New York Times Jones, but also be really rude about the New York Times. <laughs> and um, it was one of the, just one of those once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. And Rusty Younger came up with the name Not the New York Times, and that was before we even had things like in this country we had not the nine o'clock news, which was a, a a popular sketch comedy show. But because you also did not the Bible, you were the first one to use that not the. Yes, we were actually, and uh, unless you count not ready for the primetime players, but I don't think it's quite the same. No, no, we didn't. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we didn't copyright not the. But the first time I met John Lloyd, when I was actually sort of vaguely trying to get him interested in spitting image. The first thing he said when we sat down was, I have to apologize for, for stealing not the from you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In, in 82, I mean, this is the thing you're probably best known for, which is, of course, uh, this is Spinal Tap. But you were at a, a low point in your personal life. Just before you started that film, you attempted suicide. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I got to the point where I was certainly considering it, and, and I, I don't know that I actually got very close to it, but, but uh, I mean, it's a, it, it's a story I told at the Moth. Yeah, that's um, where I saw about, it, yeah. Yeah, 2009. Um, I mean, very briefly, what, 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 what had brought me so low at the time, although we, I, have to, I have to say that we had, we had done uh, a sort of test of Spinal Tap in 1979, I think it was, uh -huh. um, where we'd done, um, we basically did sort of 20 minutes to see if it would work, that we could, you know, we would improvise 
these scenes. And you'd not done improv before? I'd never done improv before, no, and it scared, it scared the living daylights out of me. But I, but I found that it wasn't quite so difficult, um, uh, especially if you had a glass of wine before the scene was shot. Um, <laughs> so we had done that, but, you, you know, I, this, this was now it was actually, actually going to really happen. And um, it, it was funded and so forth. I was staying in Malibu at a, a friend of a friend's house. It belonged to someone in the band. I can't remember exactly who. But um, Robbie Robertson, but it, the band, that band, yeah. I think I think it was Robbie Robertson, actually, yeah. Right. So anyway, and it was very sort of desolate, and I and, and I and I was very depressed because I had just done a, another parody. This this parody was a parody of federal preparedness pamphlets, because this was when Reagan was beginning to start yam- yammering about you know a winnable nuclear war. Mm-hmm. So that was on everybody's minds. So this was a nuclear preparedness pamphlet uh, called Meet Mr. Bomb. And um, Meet Mr. Bomb was uh, supposed to give you little helpful tips. Mr. Bomb gave you helpful tips about what to do in the case, you know, if your home was hit by a 20 megaton bomb. Yeah. And and, um, anyway, it's very funny and written by some very brilliant writers and very beautifully illustrated by Bruce McCall of The New Yorker. And I'd been so confident of this. News, Newsweek had told me they were going to put it on their cover. And uh, I was so confident of its, of its sales that, I, that we'd had like 200,000 copies distributed because those are the kind of numbers that we did when we did a parody. Yeah. And I'd just heard that evening that the uh, L.A. distributor, which is called something bright like, I don't know, Sunshine Distributors or something that's based in San Diego, who was, who was a sort of rabid Reaganite, had read a copy of, and would be distributing Meet Mr. Bomb, and read a copy and had not been amused to the degree that he'd had the entire shipment shredded. So I was effectively bankrupt, and, you know, it was Reagan, read the Reagan years, we were pretty depressed anyway. You think you're depressed in, in Trump era? Jesus, we were really depressed when Reagan got on board. But anyway, so... Uh, I won't go into the details because it spoils the story, but uh, but I certainly was low enough to um, consider end- ending it that night. And the next night I got up, the next morning I got up and I went into the, the first scene of Spinal Tap yeah. in the limo. Yeah. Is it true that, that Rob Reiner shot enough film to make another film? Uh, I don't, I can't remember exactly the number, the, the footage he shot, but it was something like 400,000 feet of film. What's that in hours and minutes? I have no idea, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but some, yeah, Harry, Harry once said I, that he could have made two or three spinal taps out of that. Harry Shearer, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, so anyway, it was, um, it, it was a lot of material, but, um, but he, you know, he, he obviously picked the right stuff because it seems to have done quite well. Yeah, done quite well. I mean, it's got a cult status, I think. Probably mainly to do with VHS be, of, of the time being a big deal. Yeah, I think VHS. We were very lucky in, in the fact that we we sort of came along at exactly the time VHS was was the sort of hot thing. Uh, it really didn't do well in in cinemas at all. I, I mean, people, some people got it. The, the the sort of cool people got it, but it wasn't by any means a kind of mass market movie. But VHS kind of came along and it just caught fire and uh, in. Over the, those sort of mid mid eighties years, it really did become a, a very successful and well known movie. Yeah, a few years afterwards, you were in a, a cab in New York, and you got recognised by the cab driver. He said something interesting to you. This was about uh, I don't know about uh, nineteen eighty seven, maybe or something like that. Anyway, I was in a, a cab, a New York cab, and the cabbie was one of these sort of um, acid casualties, you know, with, with hair down to his butt crack and uh, very, a very sort of uh, stoned approach to driving. And uh, he looked at me in the mirror and he said, um, weren't you in that movie Spinal Tap? And I said, yeah, yeah, I was. I was in the band manager. She said, yeah, 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 it's a great movie. Uh, you know, man, I was into Spinal Tap before they made that movie. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I think that says what we need to say. It about does say, casualty. yeah. It's, it's the perfect response. It's the exact response you'd want to the film. Having problems with the uh, what? arrangements backstage. What exactly? Well, uh, what, I some, mean, well, no. There's some problems here. Uh, I don't even know where to start. All right, this. Sound uh, check. What's, what's no, 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 no. This, this. Look, look, look. There's a little problem with the. Uh, look, this. This miniature bread. It's like I've been working with this now for about 
a half an hour. I can't figure out. Let's say I want a, mm -hmm. a bite, right? You got this? You'd like bigger bread? Exactly. I yeah. don't understand how it's like. You could fold this then. I mean, you could well, fold. no, then it's half the size. No, not the bread. No, you can fold the meat. Yeah, but then it, then it breaks, up, it breaks no, apart no, 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 no. like you this. You put it on the bread like this, see? But then if then you keep it's... folding it, it keeps breaking. Why would you keep and then you'll, it? everything has to be folded. And yeah. then it's this. And I don't want this. I want large bread so that I can put this. Right. So then it's like this. Yeah. But this doesn't work because then it's all... Because it hangs out like that. <laughs> Look, yeah. would you be holding no, this? No, I wouldn't want to eat. I wouldn't want to put no. it in my mouth. All right, A. Hey, exhibit no, right. exhibit A, right. and then we move right. on to this. Look, look, who's in here? No one. And then in here, there's a little guy. Look, yeah. so it's, it's a complete catastrophe. No, you're right. Nigel, Nigel, <laughs> I mean, calm I don't, down. Calm down. Calm, look, it's, no, it's no big deal. I'm look, sorry. It's a joke. You know, it's really... It's, 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 a, just, it's just some crack at university, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, I it's really, a joke. It's all I don't want it to affect your performance. It's not going to affect my performance. Don't worry about it, all right? just hate it. Really, yeah, it does well, it disturb me. Again. But I it's rise disgusting. above it. I'm a professional, You're right? right? It was around about that time you worked in the UK with uh, Spitting Image, which uh, I don't know if anyone in America knows this, but probably not from the Genesis video, but uh, these were these were puppets that were caricatures of of the important people of the day, Reagan, Thatcher, etc. Um, you didn't last long working on that. What happened? Um... Well, I don't. The, the details are not very funny, so I don't particularly want to go into it. There was a book written about Spitting Image um, by a guy called Lewis Cole, which has a lot of these details in it. But but I was sort of regarded as the one of the original sort of co-creators of, of, of Spitting Image with with Peter Fluck and uh, and Roger Law, and we sort of shepherded it. They did more than I did because I was in New York a lot of the time, and we eventually brought John Lloyd on board. And then there was another producer called John Blair. And to make a long story short, there were too many captains on the bridge. And John Blair and I really disliked one another. He was South African, nothing, nothing wrong with that, of course. But um, he, he, he had some of the uh, characteristics which we don't like about South, South Africans. And I must say, I took an immediate dislike to him and he to me. So it, it, really, it really, at one point, came down to... Uh, such an impossible situation that I decided to resign just for the for the future of the show as much as anything uh, and so I wasn't a member of it in the uh, after that after the first season you won a BAFTA for it though yeah I was um, yes it was a consolation prize I do have a BAFTA <laughs> nomination which I think was the only one that Spitting Image I've ever got so that gave me some satisfaction <laughs> And then you went on to do you, you work for Spy Magazine, ninety three, ninety four. So that's getting back to almost like uh, National Lampoon kind of thing, comfort zone. Yeah, I mean it was uh, Spy was, uh, was was past its peak at that point, which was unfortunate. But uh, and I took when I took the magazine over, Kurt Anderson, who's well known for um, his show on NPR, had been the editor, and um, Kurt, uh, I think, thought I would make a good a good replacement. But he didn't share with me that the magazine was about $6 million in debt, which was really impossible to make up. And it, uh, I think I did a pretty good job, but, I mean, it wasn't very long before that caught up with us. So although I do have that on my resume, and I, I'm very proud of it, I had written for them before that quite extensively, but um, the magazine did not last beyond my tenure, let's put it that way. Had you already started working with George Carlin on his book at that stage? In fact, I was sort of transitioning to becoming a full-time writer at that point anyway. I wasn't very interested in being an editor anymore. Yeah, George and I had known each other a little bit in the 60s, and um, he used to appear on a show called The Merv Griffin Show, as did my partner and I, and um, had for multiple kind of appearances. So we, we would run into him quite a bit. And then we kind of lost touch when I went to The Lampoon, uh, and I, I wrote, started writing a book after I'd left Spitting Image called Going Too Far, which was a kind of history of modern American satire. Yeah. And it consisted of, of, of sort of intense, intensive, in-depth interviews with practitioners of what I called boomer humor, which was the satire that, that I had embraced early in my career. So one of the obvious uh, people to talk to was George. And... Um, by the time I got to George, I had done a lot of interviews and with people like Mort Saal and uh, Jules Pfeiffer and various people from Second City and Terry Southern and so on. 
And usually my interviews would last about, um, oh, I don't know, half an hour to an hour, but perhaps an hour and a half if we really got cracking. Mm -hmm. And um, when I sat down with George, we were still talking six hours after the, you know, <laughs> put the first tape in. And it was just like we had been friends uh, talking about this stuff for, for ages. And uh, it wasn't long after that, that um, when, after the book came out anyway, that, that George called me up and said, okay, I'm ready to write my autobiography, but I can't write too well, and I want you to help me do it. So I said, I would love to do that. So for the next really almost 15 years, I guess it was, 15 years plus, we would meet wherever George was, and rather than doing interviews, we'd sort of have conversations about his life and what he thought about humor. And um, I gradually put this together into what uh, he didn't want to call an autobiography because he said, basically, you know, only criminals and politicians, unless that's the same thing, write autobiographies. And uh, he didn't want to call it a memoir because that's a combination of me and moi. Yeah. And so we called it a sort of biography. Yeah. And um, and that's uh, that, that was how we always referred to it, the sort of biography. It uh, it sort of came together, and then George sort of got sidetracked by writing his own extremely funny and successful books, uh, mostly in the late 90s and the early aughts. And and the book never got published while he was actually alive. Yeah. So after he died, I spoke to his estate and said, you know, I have these tapes and, and manuscripts and so on that we've been working on all this time. Why don't we do a book uh, of, uh, as George would have liked it? Uh, because that was, you know, his dream really was to, was, to, was to have this book come out and then do a Broadway show based on it. Right. And he never got around to doing it, which was very sad. Yeah. So we put the book out in uh, 2009 and called it Last Words. And um, it's still a big bestseller oh i'm I mean, so it's, glad it's, you did it i mean it's so great that, that it's there now and that someone like you who went through the same process of of saying no i'm going to tell it like it is that it, it is just a terrific book and it's just great that george was a part of it and it's just there it's a it's a piece of history it's just brilliant so thank you for doing it yeah. well great i'm glad you like it so much i, I think it, it came out extremely well and uh yeah, and as I say, it's 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 uh, George, not only his book, but George himself is is like he doesn't go away. Yeah. Uh, he's more relevant now, and, and and he lives on YouTube, luckily. Yeah. But um, he's more relevant now than 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 even than he was, you know, with, under under the Bushes and the Clintons, and um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I miss him terribly. Now, there's one thing you might have noticed I don't complain about: politicians. Everybody complains about politicians. Everybody says they suck. Yeah. Well, where do people think these politicians come from? They don't fall out of the sky. They don't pass through a membrane from another reality. They come from American parents and American families, American homes, American schools, American churches, American businesses, and American universities, and they're elected by American citizens. This is the best we can do, folks. This is what we have to offer. It's what our system produces. Garbage in, garbage out. If you have selfish, ignorant citizens, if you have selfish, ignorant citizens, you're going to get selfish, ignorant leaders. And term limits ain't going to be any good. You're just going to wind up with a brand new bunch of selfish, ignorant Americans. So maybe, maybe, maybe it's not the politicians who suck. Maybe something else sucks around here. Like the public. Yeah, the public sucks. There's a nice campaign slogan for somebody. Because if it's really just the fault of these politicians, then where are all the other bright people of conscience? Where are all the bright, honest, intelligent Americans ready to step in and save the nation and lead the way? We don't have people like that in this country. Everybody's at the mall, scratching his ass, picking his nose, taking his credit card out of his fanny pack and buying a pair of sneakers with lights in them. <laughs> In 2004, you did your book, Father Joe, The Man Who Saved My Soul. Why was it so important for you to write that book and at that time? Um, well, I, I'd been wanting to write about... Father Joe, I should say, died in, in, in 1998, and I, I had known him since I was a teenager. In, I met, first met him in 1955 and, you know, had sort of hero-worshipped him as, as as a teenager and wanted to become a monk, as I mentioned earlier. 
on the Isle of Wight at Core Abbey, and uh, that never worked out. But I never lost touch with Father Joe through all my blasphemies and uh, prodigal son behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, I never lost this sort of gossamer thin thread of, uh, of friendship with him. And he he really was a, a kind of mentor, a spiritual mentor to me, even when I didn't believe any of what he believed. And sometimes a comforter and a, a, just a terrific person to to know. And when he died in 1998, I was just, I actually, it was one of those deaths that you can't believe the person isn't in the universe anymore. And I could not write about it. It was, it was, every time I tried to write about him, by now I was sort of fully fledged published writer with books and articles to my name. I couldn't write it. I couldn't write it at all. Uh, It just came out as this sort of awful mush. And at the time, uh, this organization called The Moth had just just started. It was 1998, and uh, The Moth was in its first sort of year. And uh, we, The Moth is a storytelling group that began in people's living rooms, and you know, now is at Lincoln Center and Sydney Opera House and all kinds of other places. And it's a wonderful organization of which I'm still a member. I'm, a, a, I'm at the, the sort of senior board member of it, actually. And um, they asked me if I would tell a story. And I decided that this would be the best place to tell how, what Father Joe had meant to me. And <clears throat> so I, this was probably the scariest thing I'd ever done on stage. Because I'd never, you're not allowed to use notes at, at a moth story, and you, they, they, they sort of discourage you from rehearsing it too. They want it to be as spontaneous as possible, even though they sort of guide you and shape your story for you. And, and so I was really quite terrified, but uh, I did it at the in Brooklyn at the at BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And uh, when it came to the night at at BAM, uh, and I told the story. I was fine once I started telling the story, and Father Joe was a funny guy, and me being used to being funny, I got some laughs. And the story went swimmingly until the end, and I had to say that Father Joe had died. And on the spur of the moment, I decided that I would sing his favorite Gregorian hymn for him, which is the Salve Regina, which is a song that's been sung for centuries at the end of... Compline, which is the last office of the day in Benedictine monasteries. So I sang the Salve Regina in a cappella. Mm-hmm. And when the lights came up, all these people who had been laughing at my story were now in tears. And that had never happened to me before in my life. I, I just uh, could not believe that I had actually made people laugh and cry. And so it was kind of a life-changing moment, really. It's a, it's a cliche to say that, but it actually was a life-changing ro- moment for me as a writer. And I determined that that evening that I wanted to write about Father Joe um, by just simply telling his story and our story. And so rather later than this, a couple couple of years later, I actually took the CD that they had made of that, of that moth story and sent it around to various publishers, and they loved the story so much that it turned into a bidding war, and that's how Father Joe got written. And that, that was it. That was the story. That got, that's what got it. And he said, he said that the work you do and the work that he does has something in common. Yes. Uh, he, he said that, yes. He, well, when, 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 <laughs> at one point he asked me what I actually did, what satire was, and I sort of tried to explain it to him. And, and he said, well, it sounds to me, Tony Dare, as if monks and satirists are very similar. They, they see something wrong with the world, and they set out to do something about it. And I thought that was kind of great, yeah. um, to, be able to, to be able to see in something that you would have thought he would have been disapproved of, dis- not that he disapproved of anything yeah. very much, but, but, but uh, that he would be disapproving. On the contrary, he embraced it. He was that kind of. He was that kind of huge spirit that does that kind of thing. Tony Hendra, we're running out of time quickly. What are you up to okay. these days? You've got the uh, final edition and the final edition Radio Hour podcast. You want to quickly talk about that? Yes, absolutely. Well, the final edition Radio Hour is it, it's actually it, it's transitioning now to become the final edition podcast, but it's still called the final edition Radio Hour, yeah. even though it's only half an hour long. <laughs> um, is is um, very closely modelled on 
the National Lampoon Radio Hour of 40 years ago, um, in the sense that what we do is not one comedian interviewing another comedian or having a conversation with another comedian in front of a mic. It is fully produced sketches with sound effects and uh, characters and dramatic touches and so forth. And that uh, seems to us to stand out in the current comedy uh, spectrum. And um, it's very funny. And it's also extremely rude. Yes. And we need extremely rude in America these days. <laughs> in fact, it's, it probably, I would say, it's a lot, it goes a lot further. We go one step further than almost anyone else who is described these days as a satirist. Um, and I'm proud of that. I think we should. I always have. The Final Edition Radio Hour is a work of satire intended for people who own books, gentrify neighborhoods, and say they like kale. Please consume responsibly the satire, that is. Hello, and welcome to Are You Less Racist Than Donald Trump? The show that judges your prejudice. Here, as always, is the man who says he's the least racist person you'll ever meet so often that, well, it must be true. Donald Trump! How are you today, Donald? I'm the least racist person you'll ever meet. Exactly noted, huh? You know, they said I couldn't beat Hillary. It turned out to be the biggest. Janet, cut the mic till we need him. Okay, okay, so now, now, let's welcome our first contestant. He's an auto parts manager from Richmond, Virginia, Laron Washington. Laron, do you think you're less racist than Donald Trump? Well, I, uh, growing up as a black kid where there weren't a lot of... Oh, if he's black, then he can't be racist, right? Isn't that what they say? Right, Leroy? <laughs> it's Leron. And Leron is less racist than Donald Trump. Congratulations! You'll be moving on to the final round, Leron. See you then. And our last contestant tonight, he's a meth user from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Cletus Snotwaller. Cletus, are you less racist than Donald Trump? No, I, I'm not. Um, Nick, 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 there. Hey, do you want a job? I'm going to make you ambassador to Norway. Oh, sorry, Cletus. You're still less racist than Donald Trump. So far, so is everybody. <laughs> Don't forget to tune in next time when our contestants are David Duke, Jeff Sessions, and that guy from high school who is still posting memes about Michelle Obama. We'll see you then on... They said I couldn't win Pennsylvania, but in the end, I had the biggest... Janet, cut the mic! Ego. I had the biggest ego. And what's next for Tony Hendra? Um, well, I mentioned earlier, I, I, I am actually going to um, write a prequel to Father Joe. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it will be a fiction, a fictional book, but, but, but based on real life. So a sort of a historical novel, I think, I guess is the right category. Uh, and it will be based in the, 18, in the 12th century, 800 years ago. Um, and it's called The Heart and Mind of God. And I will be getting it out to publishers fairly soon. <laughs> well, look out for it, Tony. Thank you so much for your time today. It's just been—it's uh, been an honour to talk to you, and uh, just an absolute hoot for me. Just been a pleasure. But uh, thank you so much for your time and continued success. Okay. Thank you so much, Graham. Too. It's very nice of you. Take care.